Hey everybody, um, I wanted to lecture a little bit on liquidating distributions. Um, we're still on chapter 10 and um, the first part of the chapter concentrates on current distributions, um, otherwise known as non-liquidating distributions. And, and that's where the partner's interest in the partnership is not being terminated. Um, it, it, it might be reduced, and we saw in some cases, like in the case of, um, of uh, in the case of the example that I gave you last night with regard to a 751 exchange, that someone's interest might be uh, diluted down from, let's say, 25% and 25% interest in the partnership to a 20% interest. But it's still considered a current distribution unless the partner's interest in the partnership is com being completely terminated. And in that case, then you would follow the rules for a liquidating distribution. Now, a liquidating distribution can occur when just one member of a partnership is being terminated, his interest is being terminated, or several partners interests are being terminated in the partnership or in fact the entire partnership is being terminated and everybody is receiving a liquidating distribution in all cases the rules for liquidating distribution are the same and they are considered to be liquidating distributions now the rule for recognizing gain on a liquidating distribution is the same as the rules that we just walked ourselves through um, with regard to current distributions. And that rule is says that you only reckon, it's under 731, and under 731 you of the code, you only recognize gain to the extent that money or deemed money, um, and remember deemed money could be a decrease in the partner share of liabilities of the partnership, is being distributed and it exceeds the partner's pre-distribution basis in his or her partnership interest. So if you have a $100 outside basis in the partnership and then you receive a distribution in liquidation of your partnership interest of cash of 200, you are going to have a gain of $100 because you because 731 tells you that you're going to. Um, it kind of makes sense when, um, and you'll see this when we see what happens when you're being distributed in liquidation of your partnership interest, other kinds of property, property other than cash. With cash, we have no ability to defer the gain by reducing the basis of the cash because cash is cash. Right. So the only so what the IRS has said is when you receive cash in excess of your basis in liquidation of your partnership interest, we have no way of um, letting you defer the gain in that case. So we're going to um, we're going to make you immediately recognize gain um, in that case and. In that case, it's really likened to a straight sale of the, of the partnership interest. Um, you're just receiving cash from the partnership, um, but you could have received, you could have sold your partnership interest to, you know, some third party and received $200 in cash for your $100, um, you know, your, your partnership interest, which you have a $100 tax basis in, which is the Tax basis equals outside basis, right? So you would have, in that case, a $100 gain, and it would be capital in character, right? Because partnership interests are a capital asset. Um, so if you look at it that way, then you'll remember the rule that says, if you're receiving cash or deemed cash in a liquidating distribution, you're going to have gain to the extent that that cash exceeds your outside basis, okay? Um, now, conversely, in a current distribution, you're never going to be able to recognize a loss in a current distribution. You might realize a loss, 
um, in a current distribution, but you won't recognize the loss. Um, the way that you will, um, the, you'll have to defer that loss by, uh, you'll end up increasing the basis of your partnership interest um, or your interest rather in some of the property that you're receiving. So you'll end up deferring the loss and in some, you know, in some future period, um, it'll all come out in the wash and you'll get your loss. But in the case of a liquidating distribution, you could recognize a loss and you would only recognize a loss if the liquidating distribution consists of money, um, unrealized receivables and or inventory, but no other non-cash property. And that's rule number one, event number one that has to be there. And then event number two that has to be there is that the partner's basis in his partnership interest has to be greater than the total bases of all of those properties being distributed, including the cash. So the amount of the loss is essentially equal to the difference between the partner's basis and the partnership interest before the distribution and the sum of the money plus the bases of the receivables and inventory to the partnership. So whatever the carryover basis is from the partnership in that inventory and or receivables, plus the money being distributed, you add those together. And if those are actually smaller than the partner's basis in his partnership interest, then you're going to have a recognized loss equal to the difference in those. And there's an example in the book, it's 10-15. It's a pretty simple example, but um, the reason I like the example is because when I go on to explain what happens when you have a liquidating distribution of other kinds of non-cash property other than unrealized receivables and or inventory, you'll see that we get some really weird results sometimes um, with what we're supposed to do under 732, I believe, um, when we have um, when we have other kinds of property being distributed. So in this simple example, Maria is terminating her interest in the partnership uh, and her basis before, being, uh, before receiving her liquidating distribution is $35,000. So she's got a $35,000 outside basis and she receives a liquidating distribution of $10,000 of cash and inventory with a $12,000 basis to the partnership. So in total, she receives a liquidating distribution of 22,000, but her basis is 35. So you can see that what she's getting in exchange for what she's giving up is less than what she's giving up. So 22 receipts, proceeds, right? Minus a basis of 35 equals a loss of 13,000. And that loss will be recognized by her on her tax return. Okay? Now, now, in, now what we have to figure out is what basis does she take in, those, um, in that inventory that she received uh, of $12,000? And um, the general rule is that her basis in that inventory is going to be the same as it was in the hands of the partnership. So she, in this case, will take on a basis in that, um, in that inventory of $12,000. Now, you would think that maybe she would get a basis equal to $25,000. She's liquidating her entire, terminating her entire partnership interest, and she started out with a $35,000 basis. She received cash in the liquidating distribution of $10,000, so that reduces, um, and we always reduce basis by the cash first, and that, the reason we do that is sometimes we get funky uh, results with non-cash property being distributed, 
And so we always want to make sure that we reduce our pre-distribution basis by the cash first. So once we do that, we end up with a basis of 25. Now we know her basis in her partnership interest is being reduced to zero because she's being terminated. Uh, her interest is being terminated in this liquidating distribution. So you might think, oh, her basis is going to be in the in the inventory that she received is going to be twenty five thousand, but in fact it's not. Um, it's only going to be twelve thousand, which is the basis that it was in the hands of the partnership. And um, because remember, the difference between the twenty five and the twelve is thirteen. And I just told you that she's going to have a recognized loss of thirteen. So if she received a basis of in the inventory of 25 so that we would have a really clean like zero out, then she would end up getting a double loss because her basis would be $13,000 $13, higher than it should be. So economically, she's going to come out, everything will come out in the wash correctly so that no one's recognizing too many gains or too many losses. And she'll get out of the partnership exactly what she gave, got um, what she gave to the partnership and to the extent she doesn't get what she gave and in this case she doesn't get back what she gave she she gave 35,000 in total that's her basis um, but she's only getting back 22 and that's why they let her in termination her from partnership interest actually recognize that loss instead of deferring it now you could have a case where um, you so you never the rule is that you never get to um, increase your basis in unrealized receivables or inventory being received in termination of a partnership interest. So that was my dog, and I had to go put her in her kennel. I love my dog. She's a golden, but she still acts like a puppy sometimes. She's not quite five, and uh, it seems that she's fine if we're both if I'm just being quiet, but the minute I get on the phone and now the minute I start a video, she needs attention. So I just put her in her kennel. So now, of course, I'm going to have to kind of like uh, rehash what I'm doing. Um, so where I was at with this discussion is that in, in Maria's case, she's receiving both inventory and cash. And we have to try to figure out what, what basis she's going to take in the inventory because she's keeping that inventory now and her partnership interest is being terminated. We know that she has a $13,000 recognized loss, but we say, what is her basis in the inventory? Well, her basis in this case, in that example, is gonna be $12,000. Um, we know from the rules that we can never increase, we can never have a basis in the inventory that's greater than what the basis was in uh, the hands of the partnership. However, there could be cases where we're actually going to have a, a basis in that inventory, which is smaller than um, the basis uh, in the part, the basis in the inventory to the partnership. And that's um, a, in, a, in a case where once we reduce our cash that's being distributed to us, um, you know, reduce our basis, our pre-distribution basis by the cash, we end up with a with an ending, you know, basis that's smaller than um, than what uh, we actually received in inventory. So in that case, we end up taking a basis in the inventory equal to the basis, our ending basis in our partnership interest. Um, so it the, in other words, the shortage um, that we have in, in basis ends up being considered a reduction to our outside basis that we'll take in that inventory that we received. So, and if you received more than one kind of um, receivable and inventory, so in other words, you received both receivables and inventory, then you, you essentially allocate the decrease um, based upon the relative bases uh, uh, in the, uh, to the partnership of those items. 
and that's a similar type of um, allocation that you guys did with regard to current distributions um, of inventory and unrealized receivables. So um, when you, by virtue of you doing that, you are going to have more income now when you, when you sell that inventory and or receivables sometime in the future than you would have had if you didn't have to decrease the basis. And so essentially what the IRS is letting you do in that case is they're letting you defer the gain that you have. Because if you think about it, you do have a gain um, because in that case, you actually have um, smaller outside basis in your partnership interest than what you're receiving back from the partnership in, in liquidation of your partnership interest. Now, um, you could have a situation uh, where you're receiving in, in liquidation of your partnership interest um, a distribution of some other kinds of non-cash property, um, like tangible personal property or real property. And in that case, um, you end up with some strange results sometimes. You end up with an ending basis in that non-cash property that's not inventory or unrealized receivables equal to like a really weird figure that would be much more than you would have thought. So to do, to look at this, um, we're still looking at Maria's example now, except that, um, and so she still had a pre-distribution basis of 35,000 and she still receives money of 10, which reduces her basis after the money distribution to 25. And then she still receives the inventory of 12, so we reduce her basis by the 12, and now she has a remaining basis before distribution of a typewriter, okay? Um, she has a remaining basis of 13, and if that's all she had received were those two things, she would, take, she would recognize a loss equal to 13, and we'd be done with this equation. But in this second example, 10-16 in the book, she also receives a typewriter with a basis of $50, okay? It's only worth $50, and that kind of makes sense because no one uses typewriters anymore. I used to use typewriters when I was in college, um, and, well, definitely high school, and actually in college, too, I had a typewriter, but by the time I got into college, I think I was using an electric typewriter where I had a special backspace key that actually had like white ribbon and it would erase the, so you didn't have to use an eraser and your typewriter. Does anyone who's even listening to this lecture right now know what I'm talking about? Please say yes and that I'm not so old that I'm the only one who knows what an electric typewriter is with a, an auto correction backspace feature. Okay, I wish I had saved that typewriter, but I gave it a long, away a long time ago. I'm sure it's in a landfill somewhere or in, in an antique shop. So in the case, in this second example, she receives a $50 typewriter too. So the rule now says, guess what? In order to reduce that 13 down to zero, we don't recognize a loss anymore. Instead, we defer the loss by her being able to increase her basis in that $50 typewriter from $50 to $13,000. And you can see how that's a big loss deferral, right? I mean, she's going to have to, she's going to sell that typewriter someday, not for $13,000, maybe unless she waits 100 years and now it's an antique and it's worth that much because it's the only one left in the world. But otherwise, she's going to sell that thing for $50 or $40 and she's going to have a huge loss now on it, right? Because she has a $13,000 basis, tax basis in that, in that typewriter. Now, that's okay if she took it in distribution and she's using it in her business, right? And then she sells it a year later for $40 or $50 and she has a realized loss. Let's say she sells it for $50. And so she has a realized loss of uh, 12,000 
$950, right? Uh, $50 proceeds minus $13,000 basis is $12,950 dollar uh realized loss okay we know she realized that loss does she get to recognize it only if she's using it in a trader business so it's a 162 expense right it's it's an ordinary or ne necessary expense and it'll be um it would be a capital asset in her hands uh, it'll actually be a 1231 asset if she holds it for a year or more. So I, in my case, I'm going to say a year or more. Now it's a 1231 asset. So she'll have an ordinary loss because that's what 1231 does. It changes your character to what we want it to be. In a loss, it would be ordinary. And in a gain, it would be capital. But to the extent that we had taken depreciation on that $50 or on that $13,000 typewriter, we would have to recapture um well we would have a loss so actually you don't even have any recapture on a loss you only have recapture on a gain so we would just have an ordinary loss and now our deferred loss you know is only being deferred for a year okay what however if she just is using that typewriter personally so she's doesn't she's not using it in a trader business she will never get to recognize that deferred loss that realized loss that she had on termination of her partnership interest because she just got a $50 typewriter, but she still had basis left in the partnership of $13,000. So in that case, she's not economically the same as she was when she bought into the partnership some years ago, right? She actually has a real loss that she's never going to get to reduce her taxes for. So um, the tip that they give you in the book is um, that a partnership should do what? It should avoid distributing out uh, low basis property along with cash and, and uh, unrealized receivables and inventory because you get this really weird result that may never, uh, where, you where you don't get to recognize a loss anymore and you may never get to recognize that deferred loss. So really strange result there, very interesting. And I think one of the liquidating distribution problems may uh, walk you through that. I'm not gonna walk you through any more problems for this chapter because I already gave you a couple of Professor Viersen's liquidating distribution um, video walkthroughs of problems. Um, we can't do all the homework for you. You guys got to do some reading, <laughs> do some stuff on your own. But I did want to walk you through that. It's very interesting. Um, the other thing that I wanted to walk you through is the summary on page, uh, oh, I can't do pages here. Um, it's a summary right before... Uh, a little subsection that's called holding period in distributed assets. It's a very nice paragraph where it summarizes what we just went over. And it also um, has a key point um, that's beside it. This is the kind of stuff that I want to make sure you guys are highlighting and um, reading because it, it summarizes all of these rules, which may seem so complicated, but when you read the summary, you're like, oh yeah, just keep taking myself back to the summary, and it is as simple as that. So what it says here is that when you have a liquidating distribution, the amount of money that you received plus the, dis the your basis in your, to your total basis in the non-cash property that you receive, okay, so in a liquidating distribution, you, the partner, receive money plus um, uh, some non-cash property. Normally, the amount of money that you receive plus your basis of that non-cash property received is going to equal your pre-distribution basis in the partnership interest. In other words, there's no up or down adjustments that you're making to the basis in the non-cash property received and you will have um, no gain or loss 
The only two exceptions to this rule are this. One is when your money received exceeds your basis in your partnership interest, and that's going to cause you to recognize a gain. Or when you have money and unrealized receivables and in inventory being the only assets distributed, and in that case, you might have a loss recognized. And then in all other liquidating distributions, the partner recognizes no gain or loss. Instead, your pre-distribution basis in the partnership interest is transferred to the cash and the other property receipt. So, in other words, you don't have a gain or loss in a liquidating distribution. You just move that, like in our Maria case, you move the $13,000 ending basis that you have after the cash is distributed of $10,000, you move that over to the other property that she received, and in that case it was the inventory, and that is her basis in the inventory. Uh, I'm sorry, in the case of inventory, you would and if whatever's left over in basis, you would have a recognized loss of 13, and then you would just take a basis in the inventory equal to the basis that the partnership had in the inventory. But let's say that she receives um, cash of 12,000, I mean cash of 10,000, and then um, non-cash property, like uh, just a typewriter of 12,000. So she has $35,000 outside basis. She receives $10,000 in cash. And now she has um, a $25,000 outside basis. So in that case, she would, um, she would receive, she would not have a loss at all. Um, she would receive basis in that uh, non-cash property uh, let's say it's the typewriter or let's say it's a desk or whatever, she would receive basis equal to $25,000 in that. And in doing so, she would defer the loss that she really had um, because in that case, probably the desk is not worth $25,000. It's probably worth like, you know, $1,000 or $200 or whatever the desk is worth. And we have a situation that would be similar um, to the situation where she receives the inventory and the cash and then that $50 typewriter. So I really like that, um, that summary that's there. Um, and then uh, remember that uh, the holding period in the distributed assets um, includes the partnership's holding period. So it tacks on to the partner's holding period. So... Um, uh, if if uh, the partnership had owned the typewriter for two years already, the part the partner's holding period in the typewriter begins at a two year mark. And if they were to and that's uh, important, right? Because if that part if that typewriter in the hands of the partner is actually um, a twelve thirty one asset, it's it's an asset uh, of depreciable property being used in the partner's trade of business then they could sell it immediately and get 1231 treatment off of it. They actually wouldn't even need to hold it for a year. Um, now, um, Section 751 could come into play um, in a liquidating distribution as well as in a current distribution. And um, to the extent that it is involved, there is um, a distribution of 751 assets. Um, you treat the distribution essentially the same as you would in a current distribution. And it walks you through um, what you do. It walks you through the steps just like it did with regard to a current distribution when you have um, dis a liquidating distribution of 751 assets and other kinds of assets. Um, so just walk yourself through those steps um, when you read about it and know that it's very similar to the treatment um, where you have 751 assets being distributed in a current distribution, a non-liquidating distribution. So um, now, uh, just 
quickly going through, um, I want to just walk you through this real quick. Uh, this is just a simple example uh, where um, A had an adjusted basis of $65 in the XY partnership, and he owned it for 10 years. And he receives um, a distribution of $100 of cash. So he's going to, um, he actually is going to recognize a $35 capital gain um, because in that case he received money in excess of his outside basis prior to the distribution. So that's the exception where you're going to have gain. And then we already walked through, here's the Maria example. I'm not going to walk you through it again. The only difference here is they show you who, that Bob and Joan are the other two partners in the partnership, uh, which is irrelevant to our discussion right now because we're only focusing on Maria's liquidating distribution. Um, it, it, the other partners, I think, uh, remain in the partnership. But this is just showing you that you could have ABC partnership continue on but have Maria be Maria's um, interest be terminated, and again the the amounts here and the the facts are the same as the example in the book. Um, we've already gone through that. Um, when you're selling a partnership interest, it's essentially just going to be a capital gain or loss to you. Um, uh, if you are receiving, um, there could be a, sev a, play, a, sev a 751 play where some of your capital gain could get recharacterized to ordinary income. Um, and uh, there's not going to be any impact to the actual partnership when you're selling your partnership interest unless the sale of your partnership interest actually terminates the partnership because you end up with um, a more than 50% change in the partnership uh, ownership. Um, and if that's the case, you might have a, a termination of the entire partnership under Section 708. Um, and this is a pictorial um, where you're calculating the amount received upon sale of your partnership interest, and it includes cash, non-cash property, and also your share of your partnership liabilities that were assumed by the purchaser. So you've got to remember that when you're calculating your proceeds, you include all components of the proceeds. Okay, I'm going to, I'm not going to talk about the rest of um, the concepts in the chapter, I do want you guys to read about them, but I'm going to skip that part. And um, I will talk to you guys later. I will have office hours today, and I'm hoping that you guys are able to read through this because I don't want to do a lecture on this again in office hours. I'm going to use office hours today just to go through um, questions that people have. All right, talk to you guys later.